I received a couple of messages that I want to share with you that I think uh, we ought to pray about. One of them uh, is the Summer Wells, the, the young five-year-old from Haw Hawkins County. You probably got a, uh, an alert on that. And uh, they still haven't, uh, the way I understood it, they haven't found her. She's missing, and I think it would be great if we could pray on uh, her behalf. Also, uh, I received this one. You might remember us uh, praying for uh, uh, Jamie Wheat Weekly, who is a uh, uh, Macon County officer. Uh, at the time, she had Lyme disease and was critically ill. Found out she had West Nile virus, parvo, and so she was a very, very sick uh, person. And one of her, one of their neighbors, a 16-year-old boy, whose birthday was last week, was critically injured in a dirt bike. Uh, had a car wreck, a car, uh, a jeep. I think uh, he was pulling in a driveway, and a jeep was going about 55, 60 miles an hour, and hit the the young man. And he was wearing his helmet, but he was broadsided as he turned into that. Uh, driveway. He's in uh, the hospital at Vanderbilt. He did wake up during the CT scan, but was immediately sedated. His mother died about a year ago, and the father is completely overwhelmed. And uh, they're giving Jamie permission to help them. They are uh, a long, long way from, uh, from uh, getting back where they need to be. Uh, if he survives his injuries, he thinks we're going to need some help. We do have his name, is Jeremiah Harrison. And we've got the address, they live in Bethpage. And Kay that sent this to me said it was time for us to shine as a congregation of the Lord's Church. Boy, how true that is. A very, very sad situation. Hopefully he will pull out of this. And uh, let's, we've got the address, let's bombard him with a lot of cards. We will give this to, uh, I think Jonathan, is, his group is meeting tonight. So let's pray for both of these. Father in heaven, we come to you this day realizing that you are the God of heaven, that you have all power, you have all authority. And Father, we pray for the Harrison young man. We pray that the doctors that's treating him, the medicine that's been he's been uh, receiving would be helpful and beneficial and that, Father, he could have a complete and full recovery. We pray, Lord, for the little girl, Summer Wells, that she could be found alive and well. We pray, oh God, that everything would work out for that family. We can only imagine what uh, the parents are going through. We pray, Father, that you just continue to bless both of these families. In Jesus' name, and amen. Today is Father's Day, and I want to share something with you that you ladies already know. It's called the men's vocabulary. Men don't always say what they mean. Let me just translate this for you. When a man says it would take too long to explain, what he really means is, I have no idea how it works. When a man says, take a break, honey, you're working too hard, what he really means I can't hear the game over the vacuum cleaner. When a man says, that's interesting, dear, he means, are you still talking? When a man says, it's a guy thing, he means there's no rational thought pattern connected with this, and you have no chance at all making it logical. When a man says, I can help with dinner, can I help with dinner, he's really asking, why isn't it ready? When a man says, huh, huh, sure, honey, or yes, dear, he means absolutely nothing. It's a conditioned response. When a man says, oh, don't fuss, I just cut myself, it's no big deal. He really means I probably sever, severed a limb, a limb, but I will bleed to death before I admit I'm hurt. So get on over here and help me. When a man says I can't find it, he means I didn't really, it didn't fall into my outstretched hand, so I am completely clueless. When a man says I heard you, that means he's got the foggiest clue what you said, and hoping, desperately hoping he can fake it. When a man says, you know I could never love anyone else, he means I am used to the way you yell at me, and I realize it could be worse. When a man says, you look terrific, he means, oh, please don't try on one more outfit. We're late and I'm starving. 
When a man says, I'm not lost, I know exactly where we are, he means no one will ever see us alive again. I think some of us can relate to that, can't we? You know, when you think about fathers, most of us, our fathers are gone. I don't want this to be a sad day for you. I want you to reflect on a lot of memories. I want you to think about some things in your life, even with your parents and with your father, that brings back good memories. All of us have those. And those of you that still have your fathers, you're missing some great opportunities to tell them you love them and you appreciate them. I promise you, when they're gone, I would give anything to be able to just talk to my father again. And I want you, young people, to love and to treasure your father and your grandfather. I want to look today at the influence of a faithful man. By a father, some of us would, would maybe define him as a protector, a teacher, an encourager, someone that picks you up when you fall, someone that brushes you off and lets you cry again. Others, it may be a hero. It may be a playmate. It may be a coach. I don't know what you think when you think of the name Father. But I know biblically what we ought to be thinking about. Have you ever wondered whether or not the influence of a man in the lives of children are very important? Listen to some of these. In the past ten years, the number of murders committed by teens has risen from 1,000 per year to over 4,000 per year. Those of you that are listening by live stream and those that are present today, you may be thinking, you know, this thing of getting a, a divorce, it seems like to me it would be a better thing. Sometimes you can't help getting a divorce. I understand that. But I'm going to tell you something. You ought to think about your children. You ought to think about the future of your children. Listen to this. Over the past 30 years, there has been an increase of 550% increase in violent crime. A 400% increase in illegitimate births. This is in teenagers. A 200,000 increase in teen pregnancy. When I was a juvenile probation officer, we found all of this to be true. It was amazing at how many juveniles went into probation and to look around, you couldn't find a father anywhere. They didn't know who their fathers were. Or if they did, their fathers were not involved in the training of those children. The vast majority of teenagers involved in the statistics mentioned are from a lack of father. If you've got an outline, there's your first answer. That's all I'm going to give you. A lack of a father. Over 70%, listen to this, of all juveniles in state reformatories come from a home without a father. I got this from some of my, when we went to state training, that, that was a proven fact. Now think about this for a moment. We're looking at the definition of a father as a protector, someone that is an encourager. A father's influence in the home, I am convinced, cannot be overemphasized. The neglect of fathers had led to countless children of being harmed. In 2019, 28%, almost 29% of American children live in homes without a father. Young people, please listen to me. Think about this for a moment. You've got your future ahead of you. I, I don't know if time stands, but if it does stand and you continue to live on this earth, most of you will probably have a husband or a wife. And I hope that your goal in life is to be able to have a home and an environment that is conducive to those children being reared in a, a, a place that will help them get to heaven. I, I, I hope that that is true. Number one, I want you to notice uh, that we ought to resolve to put away childish things in the home. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, and this is almost taking it out of context other than 
I believe that there's a principle that applies. The immediate context is talking about love. Then he says in verses 8 through 10, for we know in part, we prophesy in part, talking about spiritual gifts. And then when that which is perfect is come, that is the complete revealed Word of God, when it comes, James 1.25, whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein is a blessed man. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. But look at this passage. When I was a child, I spake as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. That's what the King James says. I put away childish things. Friends, in the home, we need to put away childish things. And we, as men, we need to be leaders in our home. And we'll talk about it in just a moment. But sometimes we're so childish in the home. And it ought not be that way. Sometimes the children are more grown up and act more mature uh, than the fathers and the mothers do in the home. Number two, notice, resolve to be a man of integrity, a man of, uh, that's a faithful, a man that is responsible, and a man that serves with honor and with love. I want you to notice the Bible informs us of a man named Eli. I want to look at Eli. I want to use him today as my uh, main thought in studying about the home. First of all, I want you to notice about Eli. Eli, the Scripture tells us in chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, that Eli, he had children, he had sons. Eli was a priest. That was a man that would go in the temple, he would perform the priestly duties, he was usually a man uh, that was very, very close to God, he was a man that was a leader in these spiritual activities that would take place inside the temple or inside the tabernacle, depends where they were. And here was Eli doing a good work. Here was Eli performing a great task before God. But if you go uh, to uh, chapter 2, verse 12, you will notice what it says about Eli. Now the sons of Eli were the sons, now the sons of Eli were the sons of Belial, and they knew not the Lord. And they knew not the Lord. Let me ask you a question, son. Now, let's just stop right here. We're talking about a man that is responsible. A man uh, that loves his family. We're talking about a man that is known for his faithfulness. Should not a man want his children to know the Lord? For it is the most important thing you can do for your children to teach them to know the Lord. Eli's children, even though Eli was a priest, his children knew not the Lord. Was Eli to blame? We'll look at this in just a moment. But think about this for a moment. What is your ultimate goal for your children? Are, are you wanting to provide them a lot of land? Are you wanting to provide your children with a good education? Are you wanting your children uh, to be uh, the best on the high school basketball team, football team, go to college? What is your ultimate goal for your children? I tell you what your ultimate goal ought to be, that they know the Lord. But now, let's notice, if you will, chapter 3, verses 11 through 14. The, the story goes on. As the narrative continues, it says, And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all the things that I have spoken concerning his house, when I began, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever, for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vow, and he restrained them not. Verse 14, Therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli, that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not pur purge every sacrifice nor offering forever. Notice verse 13, and his sons made themselves vile. That comes from a Hebrew word that literally means vulgar. These young boys, I don't know how old they were, the sons of Eli, not only did they not know the Lord, but they were vile, they were corrupt, they were uh, young men that were repulsive to God. Well, what did the, you find in the text? Is Eli to blame? Well, evidently the Lord said so because the Lord said uh, that because 
He did not restrain them. I'm going to tell you something, parents. You're not doing your children any favors when you give them anything and everything on a silver platter. You may be spoiled and rotten and you may not be able to, uh, to emphasize to them the importance of the spiritual thing. You have to restrain them. He did not restrain His sons. Why didn't He? I don't know. Maybe, I'm being facetious, it could be the modern culture of, the, of that day uh, that someone like Oprah was given some instructions. It could be that Dr. Spock had been on... Uh, there in the area and her doctor spot. I'm being facetious. But the point is this, friends. God says that Eli restrained not his sons. Eli's sons guilty? You believe? Me? Yes, they're guilty. Yes, they were wrong. And God is going to punish Eli and punish the sons because they were vile, they were corrupt, and one translation says even vulgar. And guess what the text says? In chapter 7, in verse number 6, this is one of the things that most of us believe that Eli's mistake was. In verse 16, the text said, And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and to Gilgal and to Mizpah and judged Israel and all of those places. Implication could be that Eli was doing a good work. Eli was going to a, uh, a place to judge in all of these different cities. Evidently, he was busy about the Lord's work. I can remember Tom Holland telling us boys in preaching school, he says, guys, don't get so busy that you're trying to save the world that you forget to save your own family. He said... And this is a great guy that was one of the great teachers of our brotherhood, one of our great preachers. And he said, I'm telling you, he said, I've seen it over and over again uh, that you're gone so much, you're so busy trying to intervene in everybody else's problems and help everybody else, and you want everybody to go to hell. You get so busy in that that you forget that you have responsibility at home, first and foremost. You see, if you're going to be God's kind of father... God's kind of man, number one, your obligation's at home. I challenge men today, step up and be a man of your home. We'll look at that in just a little bit. Number, number two, resolve, and Jim read for us, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. Verse 28, Oh then, oh, to... Uh, men love their wives as they love their own bodies. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. You see that? Love the church. How much did Jesus love the church? He loved the church and He was willing to give Himself for it. Do you understand, young people, when you take a marriage vow that you're saying that you love her before God? I was talking to Don Blackwell about three weeks ago and we were talking about some of these things, and he made a statement that I've been thinking a lot. You know the only, only person that can join two people together is God? Somebody says, ah, oh, the preacher can... No, 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 no. God does it. You have to be eligible. You have to be qualified. And then God joins two people together. You know the only people that are the only person that is qualified and eligible to sever that relationship is God? Men join together, husband and wife. They join together, but it's God that joins them. When that marriage is dissolved, if it is eligible and a qualified to get a divorce, then it is God that dissolves it. Not the judge, not the preacher, not mom and daddy, but it is God. And we were talking about, you know, it would be just an amazing thing if in all of our congregations we understood the responsibility of loving our wives. Do you love your wife? Somebody says, yeah, when she does what I tell her to do. That's conditional love. When she cooks what I want her to cook. That's conditional love. What God says for us to do is to agape our Wives, love them. 
Sometimes love is hard. Do you remember when you were in second grade, fifth grade, eighth grade? Remember when you fell in love with that little old boy or that little old girl? And man, you were so excited, and the next day you fell in love with somebody else? You remember that. That wasn't love. That could have come under the category of like, but that's not true love. True biblical love is when I understand that I have a responsibility to my family. I have a responsibility to my wife. I'm going to love her. I'm going to love her as I love my own body. I'm not going to hurt myself. I'm not going to harm myself. Why? Because God created me. God made me. I'm special. And therefore, I'm going to love my wife as I love myself. And I'm to give honor to my wife. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Some of you, I've performed your wedding ceremony. And you know that we always do some premarital counseling. And one of the things that we always do is we go to 1 Peter 3, 7 and we say, now listen, when you come together as husband and wife, husband, you need to understand her. You've got to dwell with her with knowledge. You, you've got to know she's a different person. You, you know, this is the way we are. You know, us men, that's the way we are. Uh, women, most women are not like that. They're communicators. Mm, you might say, yeah, sometimes too much. Well, I'll leave that to you to say that. But the point of it is, we're different. Wives are the weak. Peter says that they're the weaker vessel. And what we need to understand is that sometimes our emotions are different. We're different communicators. And we're supposed to love our wives. And when you took that marriage vow, you know what you promised? Do you promise to love, to honor, to cherish? And you know, in 1976, when I made that vow, I didn't even know there was a vow made. I was so nervous. I just want this thing. Oh, and how many of you have done that? I told Blake the other day, we'll get, he, we're going to, I'm going to do this. I said, you know, it would be real nice. I talked some of you in doing it. It would be real nice if you could write something to her and read it. Me? He said, me read it? No, no. No, he said, you just say it. But I really think that's nice. I probably wouldn't do it either. You made a promise to love her. Even when it's not real convenient, even when it gets into your golf game, even when it gets into your fishing, into your hunting, even when it, so if you're not ready for all, if you're not ready to love her, and you're not ready to love her like you love your own body, you don't need to be getting married. You're not ready to get married. Not only that, resolve to lead your family. Joshua said in Joshua 24, 15, Choose you this day whom you will serve, but for me and my house will serve the Lord. I don't know a whole lot about Joshua as a leader. I know he took Moses' place and he was a good man and he was a good leader. I don't know a whole lot about him, but I tell you one thing. He got Joshua 24, 15 right. He said, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And that's what daddies and that's what husbands are supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be leading their family spiritually. You're supposed to be able to put it together that you're superintending, that you're overseeing the family environment. You know what they watch. You know how they talk. You know where they go. That's what families do. That's what daddies do. When I was a probation officer, we'd have 15, 16 year old boys that were out all night long. We would arrest them and we'd take them to court and the judge says, ma'am, why didn't you know where your son was at? Well, you know, I was busy and I worked all day long. No, no, no. What it was, she was so busy trying to do her own thing and she was staying out all night long. Her son was staying all, out all night long. He wasn't anywhere to be found. And what I'm challenging us to do is to be leaders in the home. I put this on Facebook not too long ago. Men ought to get up, go to worship, sit down in front, take your family, sing out, take notes, pray hard, give, study, remember the sacrifice, respond and lead your family and be a man. I know a man that's a, a gospel preacher. He can take weights and he can put... It's amazing. He's got muscles that uh, uh, almost big as my... Well, not hardly as big as my belly, but almost. I mean, he's got muscles. Here is a man that he runs all the... He will run miles and miles and miles. And I'm telling you what, he's in shape. And that's all he wants to talk about. Never talk about his children or his grandchildren. 
Never talk about how to lead that family in the right direction. I'm going to tell you right now, we've got some fathers here in this congregation, some men in this congregation, I'm convinced, that have proven that they've been good fathers. The good grandfathers. We've got some young men in this congregation that they're, you're doing the very best that you can. And I appreciate the fact that you're putting forth an effort to do the best you can. None of us are perfect. Sometimes we fail as a father. We're not perfect. We fail as daddies and as husbands. I understand that. But what we need to do is to resolve to be a leader in our home. I want to read this to you before I close. It was a book that I read one time, if I could do it all again. And he shares some things that uh, if he could do it, right, uh, go back and, and be a father again, that here's what he would redo. He said, first of all, if I could do it all over again, I'd love my wife more, because by loving my children's mother more, I could create an environment of security in our home. Instead of yelling and screaming and fussing and fighting, our love would be something that could see something, uh, that, could see something that would never, they would never have to worry about. Number two, I'd laugh more. I would relax, enjoy my children, and laugh at their uh, laugh at their uh, misbehavior at times. I would spend more time with them and enjoy uh, being a father. I would number three. I would present a more realistic model for my family to follow. I'd be honest with them about myself. I would lead them to know that I had problems in school too, and that I stumbled and made mistakes and I failed. I think that's a good idea. Sometimes we want to elevate ourselves to think that we're the perfect uh, student, that we were the perfect, that we never did anything wrong, that we were perfect. And sometimes it's better to be realistic with them. Say, we've been there and we failed, and you've got to get up and you've got to try and to keep doing better. Number four, I would listen to what they say. I would listen to their pains, their problems, and their worries, and their concern, concerns. I would listen to what they wanted to talk about to me. Because now I realize if I had listened to them when they were small and to their little problems, then when they're big and have big problems, they will still come and want to talk with me. Number six, I would pay more attention to the little things. I would begin to appreciate the touch of love and word of encouragement. So many times we fathers are quick to criticize their failures and slow to praise and encourage when they do something right. Number seven, I would create an environment of belonging. I would let my children to know that they belong to my family and I'm not ready to get rid of them. I don't, I'm not in a hurry to push them out, but I want them to be able to identify as part of our family. Lastly, but not least, I would make God an intimate friend of my family. I would use His name freely. I would pray. I would communicate to them that He is involved in all of our family decisions. I would want them to see me pray, read God's Word, and search for direction and for love and leadership in my life. Friends, I'm going to tell you something. When you think about being a leader, if the only thing you get right in your life is to be a spiritual leader for your home, you got it right. you got it right. Not only that, resolve to discipline your children. Boy, this is hard. This is hard. The discipline of your children. Most of the time when people think about church discipline, they think about withdrawing fellowship. Most of the time when we talk about discipline in the home, we think about getting the bailed out, or some of you have got them stories about going out and having to pick out your own switch, and that wasn't big enough, and they've got to go get another one. And I, I'm not talking about just that. I'm talking about like Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train. Train up a child in the way that he should go. When he's old, he shall not depart from it. The word train there comes from a Hebrew word that literally is a military term uh, word, and it means training, putting forth effort, energy, preparation. Train up a child. Not that you're just ready to yell at him or you're ready to beat him to death. No, you train him. You teach him how to do that. If he's not brushing his teeth right, don't yell at him. Go back in there and do it again. Go in there and show him. Somebody says, I did that 115 times. Make sure you're training them. Train them how to read. Don't make fun of them because they can't pronounce a word. Train them. Train them what's important and what's special. Not only that, chasing your son while there is hope. Proverbs 19 and verse number 18 says, Chasing your son 
while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crime. If I ever got a whipping, and I got a few, Daddy would give them to me, I'd start crying, and Mom would come over and pick me up. That's really not a good thing. We need to be on the same page when it comes to discipline. Chasing Him. Correct Him. Why? Because you want to show how mad you are? No, 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 no. You're, if you don't correct your child when they're very young, I'm going to tell you, when they get to be teenagers, they'll never know what no is. Never. They'll do their own thing. I told you the other day in a lesson about at Save-A-Lot where, or at the dollar store, and they were fussing over this toy and come to find out they were both on the floor crying, and both of them got the toy. That was the worst thing to do because the mother had already told them four times, no, you can't have the toy. Who won? The kid won. You've got to have discipline in the home. And I'm going to tell you something, parents. When you start real, real, real young, when you get up to about 7 or 8 or 10 or 12, you won't have as much problem with them. You've got to start young. Correct your son and He will give you rest. Correct thy son, and He shall give thee rest, and He shall give delight unto thy soul. Now, every daddy in here has not been real good at this, or maybe not failed at it. Have you ever whipped your child when you were mad? Or have you ever told your child that when you get home, you're going to get a whipping? Or have you mothers ever told your child, when your daddy gets home, you've had it? Boy, they're just excited when daddy opens that door and I can't wait, daddy gets home, I've, he got a surprise for me. That shouldn't be that way. We need to learn to correct our children. It's not always beating them. Beating them. It's not always... I knew a daddy one time that would slap his children. You don't do that. That's not the right way to discipline your child. You, it's more of an instruction. I'm, I, I was raised old school. You didn't ask any question. When Daddy said it, you just did it. It didn't matter what. And when Daddy gave you a whipping, if you, we had a word back in those days. It was called sass. You don't sass me, son. You sass me, you'll get another one. You all heard that word? Younger people don't know what it is. Older people do. You don't talk back to your Daddy. You don't talk back to your parents. If you did, you get a whipping. My Daddy wasn't consistent in that. My daddy was a hard-working, poor man that never had any kind of instructions, never really knew. And th this is what really amazes me. You know, before you can be an electrician or a plumber, you have to go two years, four years or something, or get on job training. You know, you get married, you become a parent, you don't have a clue how to do it. We didn't have a clue how to do it. It was on-job training. And sometimes we failed at it. And you've got to understand that. You might say, well, my daddy wasn't a very loving person. My daddy didn't do this way. Your daddy's human. You're human. But just remember, parents, resolve to discipline your children. You might say, what in the world is that? I found this, and I thought it was just so unique. They actually took this statue, and they took pieces from that statue and made the little boy. That's made from daddy. And you know, in reality, that's what happens in your life. Can you remember maybe when you got in from work and you'd leave your boots out there and your little boy would try to put his feet down in your boots and he'd try to walk? Literally, literally, that's the way life is. And surely, you, as godly parents, you would want your children to be like that. You want them to be part of you. If, if it was possible today to take your mind right now and to take pieces and part of your mind and put it into your child, what would they become? What if you could take pieces and parts of your tongue, the way you talk, the language that you use? No wonder some children don't know how to talk is because all they ever hear is slang words and vulgar talk and euphemisms and taking God's name. It ought not be that way. You see, friends, your children will grow up to become like you because that's all they know. And that's the way it's 
supposed to be. Ought to be. Have you ever had someone say, uh, you're just like your daddy? Well, you're not just like your daddy. My wife's just like her daddy, but she, she looked like her daddy, but she's not, she not her daddy. I, I, I'm not like... I, somebody said, you know, you're, just, you're like your mother. I don't know exactly what all that means. She's a female, I'm a male. I'm not just like my... But I've got a lot of traits like my mother. I've got a lot of traits that I learned from my daddy. I, I understand uh, now what that means. And, and listen to me, young people, as you grow up, I, I know you think Father's Day is, is, is something that old people celebrate. We ought to be celebrating Father's Day every day. Mother's Day every day. You ought to appreciate them because one day you'll walk over into that casket and you'll say goodbye to your daddy and to your mama. What will they? What will you leave behind? Think about it. I don't know if you've ever heard of Tiger Woods. You probably have unless you've lived in a cave. Tiger Woods is one of the best golfers to ever live on this earth. Black man, I have watched videos of little Tiger, and his daddy would be out on the golf course, and I went golfing not too long ago. I, that kind of reminded me of that, where Don took his grandson. You know? And so, Tiger's out here, and he's just a real little, and his daddy's over there playing with the guys, but he's gotten Tiger over there hitting that ball, hitting that ball, hitting that ball. And you know, Tiger said when they got home, his daddy made him chill 150 balls, he had him a little green up there, and, fifth, and, and chip that thing up for 150 times. And he said his daddy come over and put his arms around and show him how to do it. And then he'd putt. An hour. He had to putt an hour. You know, you're trying to hit that ball. That, that was real important to Tiger's daddy. What if we take that same amount of time, of training, of attention, and we put it the emphasis on the spiritual, on the godly? Man, you, we would raise up a generation of children that would make a difference in this life. What has happened too many times is the children are raising the parents. The children have no correction. They have no discipline. They don't have enough love in the home. They don't have enough leadership in the home. And since that takes place, they're looking around and saying, I don't know exactly how this thing's supposed to be done. And so these children, they marry. They don't know how they're supposed to act. They don't know how they're supposed to uh, make decisions because they've never seen it with their parents. And then it's a what I call a, vi a, a vicious cycle. On and on. Young people... Marry somebody that's going to help you get to heaven, first and foremost. Number two, make sure that when you are at home, you respect your mom and daddy. I'd like to go back and relive about 50 years ago. Can't do it. I'd be a lot more respectful. I, I, I'd promote peace in that home if I knew what I, I know now. If you're a father today, I appreciate you. I hope that you're the father that you want your little children to grow up one day because I'm telling you right now, this whole world is going to burn up. Second Peter 3, it's going to happen like a, a, a thief in the night. You're not know, going to know when the Lord comes. This world is going to burn up and we're going to stand before the Lord on the day of judgment. And the only thing that you ought to be concerned about on that day or you will be concerned about, my soul will make it to heaven. The second thing you'll be concerned about what about my family? That's what a real man, that's what a real mother is concerned about. If you're not a Christian today, you could help your family. You could help your home. You could walk down the aisle, take a seat on the front row, give your life, give your heart to Jesus in obedience to the Gospel. You can repent of those past sins. You can confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You could be immersed, baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. It's not the water that saves us. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, when we become His people and we walk and we live and we serve, man, it's going to have an influence on our children. If you need to do that, we could help you. Man, woman, boy, or girl, the invitation is open.
Maybe perhaps today that you would like the forgiveness of your sins. You need to pray for strength. You need uh, the prayers of these good brethren here today. Would you come right now? All together we stand as we sing.